Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this book discussion. It's an absolute pleasure to have scholars of such repute join us today from some of the most prestigious universities of the world. Welcome to Association of Indian Research Scholars second book discussion. We have Dr. Megan Rock from the University of Pennsylvania, whose book we will be discussing today. We also are fortunate to have with us two scholars par excellence as panelists. The first is Professor Seema Alevi from Delhi University and Dr. Farida Zaman from Oxford University. Before we begin the event, let me remind the participants to mute themselves and switch off the videos for better streaming. Also, you can type your questions in the chat box. Please do not interrupt the speakers and ensure that you are muted throughout the event. Thank you so much. Uh, we will first uh, hear the significant arguments from the book, followed by the comments and questions from the panelists, after which the participants will also have the opportunity to clear their doubts, ask their questions, and share their comments. Uh, I now invite Zeba Tamkanna, senior research scholar, uh, PhD research scholar at the Department of Comparative Literature, University of Hyderabad, to please introduce the speaker speaker of the day. Over to you, Zeba. Thank you so much, Ariba. I hope I'm audible right now. Yes, you are. Please. Thank you. So uh, let me begin with the uh, speaker today, Megan Eaton Rock. Uh, professor Megan Eaton Rob is the Julie and Martin Franklin Assistant Professor in Religious Studies. She teaches courses on South Asian religions and gender embodiment in religion. She is primarily a historian of Islam in South Asia, and her work overall investigates Islam in South Asia, viewed from the perspective of Urdu print publics. She presses on issues that illuminate the religious identity of Muslims in the 20th century and adds attention to material texts to studies of Urdu journalism. Her first book, Print and the Urdu Public, Muslims, Newspapers and Urban Life is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in October 2020. She has also co-edited the book, Muslims Against the Muslim League, Critiques of the Idea of Pakistan in 2017 with Dr. Ali Usman Asmi. Dr. Rob has two substantial secondary research interests. The first being gender and Islam in South Asia and the second being comparative approaches to the connection between religion and sport, sports in South Asia and North America. She has published articles related to her interest in gender in modern Asian studies, the Journal of the Ro Royal Asiatic Society. She is currently co-authoring a chapter on the relationship between religion and sports in the Islamic Society of Chester County for the forthcoming edited volume with Duke University Press. She is currently a junior fellow in the Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bi Bibliography. Ariba, would you want me to uh, introduce the other speakers as well right away? No, no, we'll do it when when we call upon them in the end. So, uh, ma'am, over to you, over Dr. To you. Megan Rock. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And Ariba, I just wanted to check. So I have around 40 minutes. Is that right? I looked at the schedule. That's the length it's of from 40 my... To one, 40 minutes to one hour, ma'am. Okay, great. Well, I've, I've planned for 40 minutes, so um, I'll keep it then on the shorter end of that time, uh, that time suggestion so that we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Uh, first, I want to say a very sincere thank you to the Association for Indian uh, Research Scholars and to Ariba for um, inviting me and for organizing this online event, and thank you for that generous introduction. I'm thrilled to be here today to be able to discuss some of my work with this group. And particularly, I am looking forward to questions from Professor Alavi and Professor Zaman and uh, to our general conversation. My book overall uh, is interested in two tasks. First, to explain why it is important to consider alignments with space and time when defining strands of a public. This means acknowledging that what constitutes a public can vary dramatically according to the alignments that public makes with specific geographic places, in particular in this book, the Qasbah in South Asia, and in particular with certain aspects of a Persianate past that become apparent when we look at the materiality of the Urdu newspaper. Second, connected to this first point, this book argues that we should take seriously lithographed newspapers as sources that tell us something about everyday Muslim life and piety 
in the first half of the 20th century in South Asia. Her book's argument tackles these two tasks, localizing conversations about the public and taking lithographed newspapers and their materiality seriously by focusing on the case study of a previously understudied newspaper called Medina, which was published in Bijanur Qazba in the then United Provinces from 1912 under the guidance of a man called Molana Majid Hassan. And in fact, here I want to pause. I remember one of my first conversations about Medina newspaper occurring with Professor Alvi's father in uh, Lucknow, where I lived studying Urdu um, for short periods of time. So this would have been in 2007 or 2008. I remember sitting on the porch of um, the, uh, Professor Alvi's father's home, uh, just next to the home where I was living in Mahanagar in Lucknow, discussing his fond memories of reading Medina newspaper. So I'm particularly happy that Professor Alvi is here to help me talk about um, this project that began um, in a substantial way with conversations with members of her family. So considering the material conditions of this newspaper's production is what allows us to conceive of a space where print capitalism is coherent with even acting in service of religious identity alongside national identity. So I will show you now a picture of Molana Majid Hassan and his first wife, Muhatama Khanis Fatima. In 1912, Bijnor, in what was then colonial India, this man, Majid Hassan, sold his wife, Mahatma Khani's Fatima's jewelry with her permission for the money to found the newspaper, Medina. This newspaper pledged to be the friend of the mulk, or the nation, the life of the Qom, or the Muslim community. Medina went on to become one of the most successful newspapers of any language circulating from North India and the Punjab. This paper's ultimate success is not something that most observers could have predicted. It was published in a Qasba, generally defined as an isolated uh, market town with administrative importance and with an Islamic hue. And its proprietor, Majid Hassan, was not influential or rich initially. Nonetheless, despite the newspaper's isolated beginnings, the paper Medina went on to become popular across North India and the Punjab and to play an important role in the independence movement. It was so successful in fact that Bijanur Qazba, by all accounts, a tiny town, became a publishing hub, home to many printing presses. The story of Medina newspaper and Medina press illustrates how a distinctive geographic space and attitude to time shaped an early 20th century newspaper conversation, orbiting around the star of Urdu during the movement for independence. As physical artifacts and imagined links binding Muslim community, 20th century newspapers and their distribution networks were an extension of correspondence networks that had flourished long before the arrival of the printing press in South Asia. These networks had traditionally approached matters without distinguishing between so-called, quote, secular and, quote, religious content. And I'm echoing here the vocabulary and logic that was used by colonial surveillance when identifying the character of different Urdu publications, and not only Urdu publications. The colonial government uh, insisted on a distinction between secular and religious uh, publications. So when papers like Medina failed to stay in the lane of exclusively religious content, they earned the suspicion and ire of colonial surveillance agencies. As early as 1912, the first year when Medina newspaper was being published, a list of publications um, under surveillance in UP included several publications that had been published in and from Qasbas, several of which the colonial uh, surveillance um, uh, organizations 
identified the newspaper as violating this, this rule of a division between the secular and religious. And in fact, labeled Medina, and I'm quoting here, a bigoted Mohammedan organ, end quote. Majid Hassan was linked through pre-existing kinship networks with the editors of other prominent small town newspapers across North India. His newspaper reprinted articles from other small town as well as many large city papers commenting on their approaches and engaging with them. His editorial staff were like him, products of Qasba culture drawn from surrounding Qasbas linked together by generations of kinship ties and professional associations. The editors of Medina lived with Majid Hassan while they worked on the paper. In this way, Medina built on existing relational networks among the Ashraf. While newspapers could not comment on censorship carried out on their own papers, according to colonial legislation, they could comment on the censorship of other papers. And they did so often, revealing the view that Medina and other newspapers took about the role of Urdu newspapers in a um, burgeoning sense of community. When the newspaper Zamindar, uh, published from Lahore, lost its appeal against British censorship, and this was in the 1910s, Medina published an energetic defense built on a argument that sewed the newspaper into the identity of the Muslim community, arguing that Zamindar is, quote, the property of the Mohammedan Muslim community, and that any loss to the Zamindar means loss to the community. So this sort of activism presented the newspaper conversation in which Medina was so important as an essential space for Muslims, public in the sense of providing a forum for open airing of views outside the limitations of private correspondence networks. Indeed, in this, uh, in this statement regarding Zamindar, Medina portrayed not only Zamindar, but the Urdu press, Urdu journalists as a whole, as a representative voice of the Qom um, or nation or community. So coming back to Medina as one important voice in this network, initially Medina newspaper published only 350 copies when it started publication in 1912. However, by 1922, uh, only 10 years after its founding, the newspaper was publishing 12,500 copies on a bi-weekly basis, making it in that year, the most widely distributed newspaper in India of any language in that period. Following 1922, the distribution numbers uh, declined somewhat, still holding steady at between six to 8,000 uh, until uh, independence in 1947. And after which it was still printed, but its, um, its legacy and its, uh, its form were altered dramatically by uh, independence, but that is something that this book doesn't discuss explicitly. So after, um, so Majid Hassan eventually, because of the success of the paper, became linked to the Indian National Congress political leadership of Bijnor, leveraging his successful printing endeavors into a place on the municipal board in the 1920s. And by the late 1930s, his editors were photographed with National Indian Congress leadership, as we can see here on this slide. This is a somewhat grainy clip from uh, the pioneer in 1945. And this image also appears in the book. The story of a local paper that became a national paper and one that used an influential form of printing in the context of Urdu lithography shows how an attention to the style and mode of printing challenges previously cherished dichotomies between print capitalism and religious publics by showing the ways that a European so-called printing form took on a life of its own in the South Asian context. Of course, and I want to make this important caveat here, scholarship by a huge range of scholars has already indicated that the association 
between Urdu and Islam is a relatively recent phenomenon historically in South Asia, and not one that in any way suggests a natural inherent alliance between that language and religious identity. And so I don't mean to argue that in this book or here today. Instead, my work is looking at the way that some Urdu newspapers confirmed and assisted in constructing and weaving, weaving this association between Urdu language and Muslim identity, an association that has previously tended to be explored through the assumption that in the context of the calls for Pakistan, for instance, religiosity is uh, primarily a mask for political motives. And so my approach here is not assuming a natural connection between Urdu Islam, but is interested in a social constructivist sense to tracing the role of newspapers in building and making natural, feel natural, this association. All right, so I'll continue to give a little background on the newspaper and its name. The name of the newspaper Medina means, of course, simply city in Arabic. And this is an ironic choice, considering that the newspaper was based in a Qasba with a population of only 20,000 at this point. The choice may reflect something of the paper's ambitions to provide a link with, or even conjure for readers, that holy city of Islam through its visual and material presence. On the other hand, an orthodox vision or dream experience was often associated with a stay in a holy city. And as I mentioned in the book, um, in eventually uh, readers come to know that uh, the founding of Medina was motivated in part by a, a dream that Molana Majid Hassan had. By choosing the name Medina, Majid Hassan was implying that the reading of this paper took readers on a journey without the necessity of physical terrestrial travel. Medina's first cover here displayed a dramatic image of the city of Medina and the boat that brought George V to India for his darbar in 1911. We have that surrounded by palm trees. The inclusion of the boat, and I, I hope that you can see me circling the boat here. This may have been an oblique reference to the newspaper support of the Hajj and government support for the, the Hajj. Um, it, it assisted in campaigning for government sponsored transport to Mecca in, in its pages. The cover mixed elements of Urdu, Persian, and Arabic. The city of Medina would have appeared as Al Medina if written in Arabic. And here it is simply Medina, but the title includes diacritic marks, usually marking uh, you know, Quranic Arabic sources. While the text included several words in Arabic um, uh, on the cover, the grammar of the sentences remained for the most part in Urdu or Persian. So this manner of mixing elements of three languages, on the one hand, rendered Arabic words understandable to South Asian Muslim readers, even if they did not read Arabic, while linking Nastalik calligraphy and uh, Quranic practices with Persian um, heritage. This mixing of modes assisted in fusing, it assisted in infusing Urdu newspapers with import. The proprietor Majid Hassan was involved in every aspect of the newspaper's production. He wrote articles, he proofread contributions, and edited the calligraphy on the lithographic stone used for printing. Having skill in calligraphy, he took a hand directly to the master copy of the paper that was etched onto the lithographic stone. The newspaper was edited in Majid Hassan's home with editors living on site during their work. And on the photograph on the left here, we can see the portico where the Radcliffe steam press um, used by um, Medina was located just off the central courtyard of the Hassan family Haveli. As the late arrival of Emanuel's um, regarding lithography uh, indicates, the mode of transmission of knowledge around printing both books and newspapers depended on the migration of skilled printers and personal instruction. Majid Hassan himself migrated from Lahore back to Bijnor, bringing with him his expertise um, from Lahore. And editors, both 
as part of Medina and other newspapers in the area migrated around North and Central India on a regular basis, bringing with them their knowledge to new presses. So I, in my book, I go in greater detail into the process of the printing of the newspaper. And I won't spend uh, any time on that specifically now because I want to make sure I, I talk about um, as much as possible um, in the context of the book, but I'm happy to answer questions about that lithographic printing process in the Q&A. But I do want to highlight how um, the attention to the material newspaper can help us understand certain ways of subscribers interacting with the paper um, by a brief attention to subscription tags. So following the printing, drying, and stacking of the newspaper, the sheets of the paper were taken into separate rooms of the press to be collated, folded, and sealed into packages for, uh, for shipping. Sample newspapers that I found from Reza Rampur Library show that stamps for shipping were placed directly onto the back of newspapers for mailing. And so each newspaper was folded in half for shipping and sealed by a paper seal cut directly from a gridded list of subscribers reprinted for each shipment. So we can see here um, a copy of a rare copy of one of the subscriber grids used by Medina Press for a different periodical, um, the Huncha, so Rosebud. This was a a periodical targeted to children. When copies of Medina were ready for distribution, a piece of paper like this one would have been printed with the lithographic press, with, including a gridded list of names of subscribers and their addresses. And so this is an example of one of these sheets showing that um, subscribers are communicating in a range of languages. We, we see here the presence of English, Urdu, and Hindi um, on a single small sample of subscriber patches. It also shows a wide geographic spread. Um, on only one single page here, we see addresses from Kashmir to Varanasi, from Bombay to Purnan, Bihar, and no while no long-term records have been retained of subscribers in Medina uh, Press, we know that the names of the readers traveled with the paper itself. Um, and so one of the ways that we can recover more information about distribution of papers will be paying close attention to copies of these papers that have been collected in both official and private libraries um, across South Asia. So once the uh, subscriber patches were printed, then the uh, subscriber patches were um, corrugated using probably precisely this corrugating machine. And so I will show you, uh, I've attempted to create a nice visual of what this process looked like. So we have the subscription labels printed, a perforator, a corrugator applied, and then the subscription labels detached. We have the newspaper then folded for transport. And then the subscription tag was affixed to hold the newspaper closed, keeping the newspaper you know, fresh and reserved for uh, the subscriber themselves um, after delivery. And so we have um, following delivery, the subscriber patch, and we can see the residue here um, cut open so that the um, recipient could then consume their newspaper um, satisfied in the fact that they were the first one um, reading it. The publications of Medina Press traveled the globe um, from 1912. And records of these subscriptions, um, the more that we're able to trace them, will allow us to map an Urdu reading, Urdu speaking network. The nucleus of that network significantly remained in the Qasba Bijnur, gesturing in its images to a holy, gesturing in its images of a holy city, a space apart that the newspaper offered its readers far and wide. The rest of my talk will deal with how we see an attention to the calligraphy and discursive content of Medina's text to show the impact of Persianate models on the Urdu newspaper model, influencing 
the reading public that it targeted. Although this print technology originated from outside of the subcontinent, we can't talk about a wholesale import of either methods of reproduction or certainly not specific values that scholars of European book history often associate with the history of print in a universalizing sense. In particular, the association between print capitalism and secularization is brought into tension by this micro study of Medina. Benedict Anderson, who described the rise of the nation as, quote, the most universally legitimate value in the political life of our time, end quote, linked the rise of nationness to three trends that reinforced this separation. A decline in the belief that sacred texts have privileged access to or exclusively embody truth, the decline of belief in a central monarch ruling by divine right, and the development of a sense of shared experience of time among a group of people separated geographically, referred to by the phrase imagined community. Print capitalism is one of the conditions of the emergence of these tr three trends in Anderson's summation. The example of Medina and some other Urdu newspapers shows that print capitalism did not necessarily correlate with a decline in the belief that sacred texts exclusively embody truth. In addition, the shift Arabic model, the shift to Arabic models that several historians have observed in the 19th century South Asian context may be qualified once we observe the retention of aesthetic uh, models derived from Persian that continued to assert their influence in the form of the papers. We can see this continued influence in the continued emphasis on the Stalic calligraphy and the carrying forward of Persian newsletter or akhbarat models in newspaper publication. I'll pick aside about how calligraphy is often discussed um, in uh, history of Islam more broadly and how this book is contextualized in that uh, conversation. Contemporary scholarship on the power of calligraphy in Islam almost always refers to Arabic, Nusk, and other writing in the Middle East, broadly defined. For instance, Brinkley Messick's The Calligraphic State explores contrasts in the transition from a state apparatus founded on calligraphy to a modern bureaucratized authority as demonstrated by a shift from handwritten manuscripts and letters to the print production of modern legal texts in Yemen. There are many significant differences, obviously, between the Yemeni context and the South Asian context that explain the divergent influences that the introduction of print had in each region. Yemen was characterized by a state-controlled publishing culture, which experienced significant diversions into small-scale printing presses in the 19th century. This pattern is in contrast to South Asia, where publishing was an endeavor decentralized from the introduction of print technology. In addition, missing in the Yemeni case, for instance, was a profoundly important element that was crucial to the South Asian context, the early introduction and wide adoption of lithographic technology, a technology that far from undermining actually supported the continued importance of handwriting and in particular, nastalik calligraphy. These differences also distinguish South Asia from the late Ottoman Empire, a context which has been explored by many scholars, but for instance, by Zoe Griffith. The existing scholarship on calligraphy in Islam, on the one hand, tends to assume that the metropole of Islam is the Middle East. Um, of course, despite the majority of the world's Muslims residing in South and Southeast Asia. Work focusing on digital calligraphy, on the other hand, assumes that handwriting and print were always mutually exclusive um, in the Islamic context. And neither of these assumptions is useful to an understanding of the Urdu press in North India. So in this respect, I found useful the work of Jamal Elias and Jürgen Wasim Fremgen, who both focused on the Stalik calligraphic traditions in Pakistan demonstrating the value of questioning some of these received assumptions in history of Islam and calligraphy broadly. 
scholars have observed that in the 19th and 20th centuries, Urdu speaking Muslims, and this is of course acknowledging that this was the period when Urdu was becoming a category in the 19th century, Urdu speaking Muslims were turning towards Arabic and English models of intellectual production. From Halis Masadas, in which poetry is bequeathed to Urdu as a legacy by the Arabs, to his introduction to poetry and poetics, in which Persian poetry is not mentioned once in the entire book, there is plenty of evidence to demonstrate that Urdu speakers were distancing themselves from Persian models of intellectual production and embracing Arab and English models instead. A 1912 editorial in, the, in Medina exhorted Muslims to bolster their faith by protecting words penned in the Arabic scripts specifically. So one issue included a diatribe against a press in Amritsar for publishing sections of the Quran written poorly or with errors included from the selfishness of their own prophet. And that's a quote, the selfishness of their own prophet. And I will include a section of this here. So in the same article, Medina recommended Muslims avoid publishing houses that employed sloppy methods in printing so that there might not be weakness of faith from the publication of those. So cultivating this sort of regret translated into protection for quality in printed reproduction. Medina threatens to send a request to the government to protect the proper publishing of texts in Arabic. And so here, um, you know, ideally I would have the Urdu and the transliteration in the English, and I've just had to uh, prioritize the transliteration um, and the, the English translation just because of space. But I'll read out loud this short section from Medina. Afsos hai ki nai tazib aur jadid roshni ke zamane mein Islam ke madhi jo haqiqat mein nahayat be adab sabit ho rahe hain apni zati manfaat ki gharaz se Quran Sharif ke ishtiharat mein ayat Qurani batur namuna dikhkar khariddaran kalam zabani par apna miknatisi aur beja asar dalte hain. Okay, so it's regrettable that in a period of new culture and modern enlightenment, the opponents of Islam who are in truth showing themselves to be uncivilized or having a magnetic inappropriate effect on customers of the holy word in their publishing from selfish concern with their own personal profit when writing out examples of chapters from the Quran. So on the one hand, we see evidence in Medina of a protection for Arabic specifically and an emphasis on Arabic language knowledge. However, and ironically, this same period that's associated with a turn to um, Arab models is a period when the British Raj, having done away with the illusion that they were exercising power through the Mughal emperor, leaned ever more heavily on Mughal models of governance. I'm thinking about the 19th century here. We also see independence of this shift in newspapers, a retention of Indo-Persian models of calligraphy and forms of periodical publication that have been underestimated. So in slight counterpoint to observations about the increased dominance of Arab models, it is clear through polygraphy and discursive references to Persian newsletter traditions that newspapers continued to draw on Persian influence. While many areas of life were characterized by a turn away from this influence, and in certain respects, as we can see here, this included newspapers in the early 20th century, the calligraphy and the aesthetic form on which the papers were built preserved the legacy of Indo-Persian influence. This is particularly apparent in the continued emphasis on calligraphy and specifically Nastalik calligraphy, as well as discursive references to the Akhbarat tradition. While Arabic quotations in Medina and other Urdu newspapers would appear in Nasq, the lithographic newspaper's emphasis on the Salik revealed the formation of a distinctive set of visual reference combining Arabic and Indo-Persian influences. Because the publication was a regularly published newspaper rather than a book, the clarity of the calligraphy is naturally less than that expected in a published book of poems, for instance, where the publisher enjoyed the luxury of, of time and copy editing. Right, so we've already taken a look at the first, uh, one of the most distinctive covers, the first cover of Medina. And we've talked a little bit about um, how we can understand these dramatic images. And I'll show you another copy here. 
until Margaret Purnell's work on this subject, the origins of Urdu newspapers in the Akhbar Navis tradition were obscured, permitting the assumption that European printing press and newspaper models guided the development of Urdu print exclusively. As Margaret Purnell and more recently Michael Fisher have demonstrated, there are significant continuities between the Persian language akhbarat or newsletters of the Mughal period and akhbarat as they became known as newspapers. The method of knowledge exchange in use from the height of the Mughal empire until uh, as late as the 19th, uh, as late as the late 19th century employed clerks who gathered information about the central Mughal court. In the 16th century, Emperor Akbar established the practice of clerks recording court diaries for the reference of government servants and courtiers, as well as to reflect the emperor's symbolic significance as the embodied spirit of the empire. News writers called Akhbar Navis emerged at the same time. They also collected records at the central court, and in this case were employed by either an individual or a group of subscribers to transmit the information to Mughal outposts. In this way, regional leaders and interested parties could keep tabs on developments at the courtly center without jeopardizing their hold over state matters at home. Kinship groups associated with the roles of a Khabar Navis correlate with trends in the Ashraf more generally. Many of the, the writers of the news, um, or a Khabar Navis or Waqiya Navis, would have been Muslims of Central Asian heritage, and many, of course, were not Muslim. The 18th century Maratha Powers uh, collection of Akhbarat reveals that most Akhbar Davis under Peshwa rule hailed from Islamized Hindu castes, so Kayast and Khatri, known for their membership in the scribal elite. The East India Company adopted the Mughal network of Akhbar, of Akhbar Davis, or news writers, and the British eventually institutionalized and bureaucratized that system of newsletter writing to suit their purposes. By the early 20th century, the British had come to depend on newspapers to do the type of information gathering legwork that a Khabar Navis or newsletter writers had done previously. Newspapers originating in local communities, including Medina, self-consciously claimed the tradition of the Akhbar Navis through their titles, section headings, and particular use of Persian. Persian and Urdu newspapers of the 19th and 20th century claimed connection to the heritage of Akhbar Navis in these three distinctive ways. So first and most apparent is these newspapers incorporated the term Akhbar into the title of the publication. Medina always referred to itself as Medina Akhbar in newspaper bylines and in editorials, establishing a verbal link between the Akhbar Navis tradition and the Bijanur publication. Second, published articles often referred to the Akhbar of specific locations when reporting news from other localities. For instance, Medina often refers to the Akhbar of Indian provinces and foreign countries entitling the section of each newspaper discussing national and international news, Am Akhbar or Am Thar or General Akhbar and telegrams. This wording makes clear that Akhbar is being referred to in the sense of private correspondence between the writer and the editor of Medina. In the same way, correspondence could and did send telegrams directly to the editor of Medina for publication. The mode of presentation implied that Medina was publishing news gained from a network of Akhbar Navis or news writers placed across India and across the world. Medina also noted down the source and the date of each transmission to underline its authenticity as fresh correspondence. Fisher points out that many newspapers of the period, late 19th and early 20th century, employed Persian language and terminology to establish another link between their publication and the rich tradition of Akhbar Navis. And Medina is no exception to this trend, regularly publishing Persian poetry and its editors as well as correspondents often wrote in heavily Persian inflected Urdu. Medina presented itself as the early 20th century incarnation of the Akhbar Navis using the telegraph 
uh, to gather information from personal sources in order to keep readers abreast of developments at the center and abroad. This identification with the tradition of a Khabar Nadis justifies the intensity of Medina's frustration when it's denied access to knowledge. For instance, Medina's frustration at the failure of both the All India Muslim League and the Congress uh, to disseminate regular reports regarding their activities. For instance, in 1917, a particularly virulent article in Medina lambasted both groups for not submitting a credible report on their activities for almost two years. This withholding of information would have seemed even more threatening, considering Medina's self-defined role as a Khabar Navis, as a collector of news for the Muslim community. However, in contrast to the Akhbarat models of the Mughals and the company, Medina, like other Urdu newspapers in the 20th century, increasingly targeted Muslim subscribers and marketed itself as a Muslim source of Akhbarat or news. Although Islam influenced the practice of Akhbarat collection and record keeping under the Mughal state, Akhbarat were primarily tools local leaders used to build an arsenal of information for a range of purposes, rather than a means to address or cultivate a particular religious community. The evolution of uh, some Urdu language newspapers invoking Persianate traditions, and Medina is an example of this type, marked a sea change in information dissemination, in religions linked to identity among Ashraf in North India. Margaret Pornal goes so far to call the network of news writers in the 19th century the nucleus of the public sphere. Extending that central status to writers of Akhbarat in the 20th century, an emphasis on the association between language and religious identity in this nucleus of the public would have been influential as well. In content and appearance, Medina imbued itself with value to Muslim audiences particularly. Scholarship on the transmission of oral knowledge to print in Islam has identified a dichotomy between the way the manuscripts preserved the written word, requiring a stamp of approval or an ijazat before it could be finalized, and the impersonal way that print is seen as preserving the written word, mass produced, industrialized, bureaucratized. Medina and the many other Urdu newspapers that used the lithograph to the lithographic press to preserve Urdu calligraphy formed a bridge between the intensely personal correspondence tradition and the world of mass print. Neither a manuscript nor a letter nor a soulless copy Medina invoked the personalized correspondence networks of the past in a mass produced form. In this way, it married Persian newsletter models with images referencing an Arab inflected pan Islam to create productive Urdu newspaper to create a productive Urdu newspaper public targeting a Muslim readership. Visual and structural analysis of Medina newspaper in my book shows that in a printed newspaper, even considering the range of discursive content of the paper, the form, in addition to the discursive content, could be sending a range of messages. So for instance, even if contents were explicitly so-called secular, they could be simultaneously religious in form. This religious quality derived from the newspaper's visual elements, its association with holy spaces, its use of calligraphy and invocation of the meaning of calligraphy. Far from arguing for a clear divide between sacred and secular, the case study of Medina shows and argues against the utility of drawing a strict boundary between these two categories in descriptions of strands of the public um, in South Asia in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, uh, the English language category of religion, like that of the public, was increasingly in conversation with the place of Islam and Urdu. And that dynamic bore out in visual references to Muslim spaces and its formation of literary publics. Thank you.
so that's the conclusion of my short uh, my short talk discussing and, and covering a few of the themes from my book. And I'm just I just want to highlight my email addresses here in case anyone you know wants to to be in touch. Um, should I stop my screen share now, Ariba, so that yes, people can yes, see? Please. Okay, all right. Sure. Thank you, ma'am, for that illuminating lecture. We learned a lot from it. And the scholars that you have mentioned, we should surely go back and you know read the works for understanding in com uh, 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 writing com completely. Uh, I think uh, before we give our comments and ask our questions, it is best that the uh, panelists you know, uh, uh, get the chance. So I request. Zeba, to please re read the introduction about Professor Seema Alavi so that she get, gets to, you know, share her comments and ask her questions. Over to you, Zeba. Thank you so much, Ariba. Uh, let me just uh, thank uh, Professor Rob for that amazing lecture. And uh, I'll begin by introducing Professor Farida Zaman. Uh, she's an associate professor of the of history Seba, of Seba, Seba, please in, introduce Seema, Professor Seema Alavi. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, forgive me. All right. <laughs> uh, let me then begin with uh, Professor Seema Alavi. Professor Seema Alavi is a professor of history at uh, Delhi University, India. She specializes in medieval and early modern South Asia with an interest in the transformation of the region's legacy from Indo-Persian to one heavily affected by British colonial rule. She has written books on the military and medical cultures of the region from medieval to modern times. Her most recent book is Islam and Healing, Loss and Recovery of an Indo-Muslim uh, Medical Tradition, 1600 to 1900. Uh, this was published in 2008. Uh, Professor Alavi earned her PhD from the University of Cambridge in England. She has twice been a Fulbright Scholar and a Smart Visiting Fellow at Cambridge and with a Visiting Scholar at the Harvard Yenshin Institute. Uh, she wrote Sepoys and the Company, Tradition and Transition in Northern India, 1772 1830, uh, in, uh, and, translated, uh, and translated with Muzaffar, has, uh, Muzaffar Alam, uh, European Experience of the Mughal Orient. The Ijaz A. Arsalani, Arsalani, Persian Letters, 1773 to 1779, of Antoine, Antoine Louis Henry Pollier. She edited the, India, uh, the 18th century in India uh, uh, and served on the editorial board of several journals, including modern Asian studies. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Eva. With this, we call upon Professor Seema Alavi to please share her comments and also ask questions if she has any. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ariba, and thank you so much for this introduction by your colleague. And uh, thank you, Megan, for a very brilliant uh, talk, which really sitting in Lucknow, uh, I enjoyed. And thank you for mentioning my father. I will definitely... Uh, pass on your greetings and your warm wishes uh, to him. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, reading your book and I uh, really enjoyed um, your talk. And I think what I'm going to do is that I have a few written comments that I would share uh, with you, uh, basically by way of uh, culling out some of the most important and significant uh, points that emerge from your talk um, and from the book, uh, which indeed, uh, you know, um, are very, very significant interventions um, in the more, uh, you know, larger, uh, often mooted uh, issues of South Asian history. And I think that uh, some of my, the, the comments that I'm going to share are in that spirit, you know, uh, culling out the main points and linking your book and its significance and its major interventions uh, in some larger debates and issues that have been, that have concerned South Asianists over the last decade. So let me begin by saying that I particularly liked 
the way um, the book, uh, Professor Rob's book begins with a discussion of the readership and audience of the Medina newspaper, rather than its production and content, uh, which is normally the case, you know, and I think that was absolutely brilliant, the way she began with the audience. And through the readership of Medina, the book leads us to the bylanes and bazaars of Bijnor, offering a very textured discussion of life in this small town, uh, Kaspa. Uh, Professor Rob uh, keeps the focus on the everydayness of life uh, to tell her, tell her story of the transformatory role that, the, that this particular Urdu newspaper plays uh, in late 19th century and early 20th century India. Um, and this kind of continued focus through the chapters of the book on the everydayness of life, I found particularly significant, if not exhilarating and exciting, uh, which is, as I said, missing in most of the um, rather dry discussions of print culture that I have, you know, read. So this was particularly exciting, you know, this everydayness of life and print. Uh, by her, uh, but her narrative, I think, um, of this transformation. Uh, that this newspaper is bringing about in the everydayness of people's life in the 19th century is of course not a dry story uh, of print capitalism creating and hardening the binaries of private and public, which is normally the conventional way of talking about um, you know, this, the transformation brought about by print capitalism. Instead, I think what, was, what is extremely significant and new is that Professor Rob, uh, Rob's discussion of printing is located, um, you know, it rejects the, the public-private dichotomy and uh, the printing is located in the most private sphere um, of this town, which is obviously the household, the home of its not so wealthy yet notable owner, Majid Hassan, about whom and whose premises we heard so much in her talk this evening. Now, the interesting way in which she brings together, I think, print, the family, and the household in the small town of Bijnor makes her talk about alternate notions of time, space, and work that shape the public sphere and blur its demarcations with the private sphere. And I think that is one of the most important and significant interventions that Professor Rob is making in the relationship between print capitalism and many of the social uh, you know, discussions of what uh, the transformatory role of print capitalism is in the 19th, long 19th century. Um, and I think this has this kind of blurring of the private and the public by focusing on the family, the household, the, the kasba, the everydayness of life um, has very significant implications on how we study the fashioning of Muslim identity, community, imagined or otherwise, and of course, Muslim nationalism. And of course, in Professor Rob's very uh, unique and uh, a very different take uh, for fronting the household, the family, the private sphere, and talking about these issues, uh, you know, bringing print in close contact with, uh, with the household and the family, uh, issues like identity, Muslim identity, community, uh, nationalism, they appear far more accretive, uh, drawing from many more reference than we have, uh, you know, conventionally been, uh, you know, uh, introduced to in uh, earlier works. Now, thirdly, I think, methodologically, I was quite excited by the book, although Megan doesn't make this point, but I think, uh, you know, it's worth making because, uh, and I think uh, she should consider making it in other essays that she writes around this book, which is, I think that the book is a wonderful case in point that uses the myopic lens of microhistory with its rootedness in time, space, and materiality to tell us the big macro story of Muslim nationalism, community, and identity formation in this high period of nationalism. And I think this, this idea of micro history telling us a big history, big story, big narrative, this book is, I think, the perfect case in point for that kind of methodological approach. Um, I think Professor Rob focuses on the detailed micro history of Bijnor, the printing press, and the families and staff associated with it all intact 
to narrate the history of Muslim connectedness with the world outside. Indeed, like all exciting micro histories, she puts the spotlight on the many experiences of the printing press in this small town across families, kinship ties, gender, class, and through these stories, which I found fascinating, she offers us a thick connectedness of things, both big and small. And I think that really excited me. And that is, I think, one of the very, very novel, refreshing, significant take methodological takeaways from this book, this, this particular use of micro history um, to tell us a big story. And I think in doing that, in following this kind of approach, it is here that her book very rightly, and, and I would completely agree, offers the perfect correction to both the imagined community idea of Benedict and Anderson and the more Hebamasian kind of idea of the creation of the public sphere, both of which I think, uh, uh, both of the concepts and both of the authors see print capitalism alone as having a somewhat transformatory role and, and pay relatively less attention to it being contingent on time, space, local, and most importantly, families and people who inhabit these spaces. And Professor Rob's spotlight on those, you know, families and spaces um, and households, uh, of course, completely, uh, you, you know, uh, and very rightly and uh, in a very welcome way, um, you know, questions uh, these, uh, these received wisdoms of the past. And finally, I think that just one last point that uh, in talking about the materiality of the press, um, you know, I really like the way she brings in other technologies that are changing lives, like the railways and the telegraph. And the, the, I like the, the, the focus on the timing of these um, you know, technologies that are playing an equally transformatory role um, and uh, together, you know, how an Urdu public is being created. So it's not really the lithographic press alone that is defining uh, the profile of this Urdu public, but it's, it's about, you know, the temporality and spatiality of other technologies in tandem with the press that are also playing a very, very uh, a transformatory role, which is fascinating, I think. Now, I just, I'm sure there'll be m m many more questions, but I just uh, end with a little more discussion and clarification, which I'm sure will happen in the evening about this kind of, you know, link uh, be uh, between Urdu, Persian, uh, Arabic, um, the shift from Indo-Persian, uh, you know, literary uh, kind, of, kind of spaces to a more Arabic oriented leaning in, as we move into the 19th century. And what does these linguistic shifts, um, you know, from the Indo-Persian to the Arabic, which starts uh, as our common guru, uh, Professor Francis Robinson, uh, you know, introduced to us um, uh, that, you know, this, this, which, this shift to Arabic, which begins from the late 18th century, what does it mean for Muslim identity? Uh, you know, does it mean, uh, what are, so what does it mean for Muslims? You know, is it, is the shift, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving towards uh, an Islamic identity from a Muslim identity? Is Indo-Persianate a Muslim identity and shift towards Arabic and Islamic identity? You know, what are the link? What, what is the difference? What are the, what do these transitions um, and shifts uh, in the literary um, bends that are taking place in the long 19th century, what do they mean to Muslim identity? Uh, you know, what is the difference between Muslim and Islamic identity? How are these shifts taking place and what do they mean? So I think we can have a little more, um, you know, discussion on this. Or, or, you know, what are the kind of interst interstitial spaces that these linguistic bendings are opening up for the Muslims and how are they redefining themselves, uh, you know, because locating themselves in these interstitial spaces uh, in the long 19th century, uh, Muslim, Islam, Arabic equal to Islam, Indo-Persian equal to Muslim. Is that the case? These are some of the issues which I think we really need to flesh out a little bit more. I think I'll stop here um, and uh, hope for a nice uh, discussion. And thank you very much again to these young organizers um, and of course uh, to Professor Megan Rob for this absolutely wonderful book. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking time out of your busy schedule to read the book and also join us today and make the comments. Thank you so much for that. Uh, if Pro Dr. Megan would like to respond to her questions, over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for those generous comments and for engaging with this book. I think like all astute commentaries, all of the most astute commentaries, Professor Alvi's comments have helped me understand more clearly some of what I am trying to do um, in this book. And your comments have helped me really think um, more carefully about what I can do to build on this work um, to, to specify you know, my, my, the direction of my research trajectory. I was particularly, so I'll, I'll respond to a couple of the comments first, just uh, b because they were really, they really resonated with me and then I'll shift to your, um, your very important and very useful question. Um, I think that um, I completely agree that it is important and I, I could have done more to emphasize the methodological innovations in the work. Um, it is only in um, retrospect that I have come to see the important connections between microhistory as a methodology and its, its inherent and organic connection to my theoretical interventions uh, about time and space. It's only through granular it's only through granular attention to the everyday lived reality of what print meant to people that we become aware of how these um, very, the, the theories of um, private public binaries and also theories about what print capitalism supposedly did to the public, um, it, it only then becomes a, um, apparent just how insufficient those categories and approaches are for understanding um, what's happening. So I really appreciated that reflection and invitation to emphasize more what the, uh, what the methodology of microhistory has to add to histories of um, the development of um, nationhood. Absolutely. That's very well taken. And um, I want to then shift from, um, from from that to thinking a little bit about your question, which is, which is so important. <laughs> and um, the way I understand your question is how, how do we understand and reconcile, you know, the shift to Arabic models to, uh, in the context of these larger questions about, um, you know, Muslim and Islamic identity transforming in the 19th and 20th century. So the way I see this book's, inter this book's intervention is uh, kind of fighting a war on two fronts in a way. On the one hand, right, we're, we're um, saying the printing press, you know, is not arriving in South Asia impregnated with these liberal Habermasian ideas of um, the division between private and public. Um, and, and, and I think that the response and the alternative to these Habermasian and Andersonian ideals is much more clearly articulated in the book than, um, than the, the, the war I'm fighting on another front, which is simply observing that, um, that in the context of a growing attention to the Arab world and a growing dependence on Arab models, there is still a persistent, um, there is still a persistent influence of Indo-Persianate models that we can see, yes, through discursive content and publications, but also through the form of those publications. And I think that you, I think that if I could read between the lines of your question, um, I think that you're right that the implications of that observation are not yet sufficiently fleshed out, right? And it's something that I need to think more about. What does it mean? What does it mean to notice the persistence of these Indo-Persian models? Um, I, and, and it's something that I am continuing to reflect on as I continue my work on journalism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, one, so this book I think goes far enough to maybe tentatively suggest that there's a stronger alliance between the, um, between a kind of Indo-Persian Islamic model and the Islamicized model uh, that, that, we're, that is, um, connected to growing Arabiz Arabization. But um, 
but really, I think this book stops there, stops at, at noticing this trend and noticing the persistence of these Indo-Persian models. I can tell you what I'm thinking right now at the moment is that, that there is this, a type of parallel between emphasis on the turn to the Arab world and the, the, the Muslim metropole. There's a there's a parallel between this and the, the tendency to dip, over depend on Andersonian and Habermasian um, conceptions of the public. There's this sense of South Asia turning outward to find something that it then imports. And so, um, so the persistence of Persian influence I, or Indo-Persian Islamic um, traditions, I think points in the same way in a microhistory sense to an attention to space and time that even if we see the growing influence of you know arab models of the arabic language we must not see these as a wholesale import of what this you know of, of what the so-called muslim metropole um you know conceived of as arabization um so thank you very much for your your compelling comments and questions. Yes, I would love to hear your response to that if, if we have time. Well, yes, I think you asked, I mean, it's very true what you said right at the end that, you know, that uh, I think what we really need to do is that even if we uh, uh, continue to argue with the idea that, you know, which I agree, and I also argue uh, similarly in my Islam and Healing book, that, you know, following from uh, Professor Francis Robinson's idea that there is an increased Arabic learning streaming into uh, India from the late 18th century, which has uh, very, very significant implications for all kinds of things. Um, so if we continue with that argument through the 19th century, then I think what you said right at the end is absolutely right, true, that we need to then see how this streaming in of Arabic is being healed into, uh, you know, an Indo-Persianate uh, society. And what are the implications of, of that healing? Um, you know, that is, that is doing, that it's doing, I mean, healing, I mean, with a double E, you know, that how it's, it's Absolutely. embedding itself, um, you know, so, and I think that, I think that your book and Professor Robinson's earlier works and your book um, really opens up uh, this vista of, uh, you know, uh, look at this, uh, looking at uh, these linguistic turns and bends and orientations um, uh, in, and the kind of uh, social uh, and the kind of changes they are bringing, not just politically, but also in the social fabric, uh, you know, uh, of uh, 19th century India. So, yeah, so, you, you know, uh, it's, it's absolutely exciting. And I think it opens up vistas for fresh and new research on this bedding down, let's say, of Arabic uh, into an Indo-Persian uh, impacted society. And what does it what does it do? As you yourself pointed out in your talk and in in this response, that uh, what does it do to Indo-Persian? It because you your book and your talk continue and very rightly continues to assert that Indo-Persian influence never dies. You know, it lingers on right till the 20th century. So obviously, what are the interstitial spaces that the bedding down of Arabic is opening up? Uh, and how are Muslims and questions of Muslim identity being, you know, healed uh, into those interstitial spaces? What does it mean for so many, for Muslim identity, community, nationalism? What does it mean? I think it means uh, many new things if you look at it in, via this route, <laughs> which you have opened for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe someone here will take up some of these questions as well. I'm certainly going to continue thinking about it, but I hope that this will be an invitation uh, to some of the students who are looking for <laughs> research projects to focus on this as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And especially people who know Arabic, you know, they would be the best people to work on this. Some young, energetic yes. PhD scholars. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, how do we proceed now? Do, is the next panelist on, Ariba? Uh, yeah, sorry, I think it was a network issue. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you. I can also. Okay, sure. Uh, actually, there was a network in my, problem at my end. 
So yes, as ma'am po rightly pointed out, I think it should be an inspiration for the young minds to work on things that have been pointed out. So, you know, fill, try and fill the gap in literature. So I hope some scholars like Zeba and others who are interested in this area will take this up. <laughs> Actually, it was Zeba who identified the book, kept track of it, and, you know, was the uh, one who insisted that, you know, we need to call all these people. So I, I think... You know, someone like her and her co colleagues could work on this. Thank you. So now, <laughs> now, I would like Zeba to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Farida Zaman, and uh, then she can uh, give her comments and her questions. Uh, thank you, Zeba. Uh, I will now introduce Dr. Farida Zaman. She's an associate professor of the history of Britain and the world and a fellow and tutor of modern history at Somerville College. She currently has two main areas of research. The first is the study of Muslim political activists, uh, religious scholars, journalists, and poets in early 20th century British India. She situates development in their thought within the history of worldwide war, political revolution, and imperial decline. The second research area concerns history as an academic discipline in Britain from the early, late 18th century and its relationship to the expansion and legitimization of empire. To date, she has also worked on memory and nostalgia, heritage and imperial visual culture, and political visions of the future in 19th and 20th century. She is broadly interested in teaching and supervising research projects that develop an understanding of Britain and its relationship to the wider world since 1750. Over to you, Ariba. With this, we call uh, another scholar of, you know, great repute and who has worked so, and is an, I think, an expert on this area, who is also from Oxford. So I think we are all nervous and excited to hear her point of view. Over to you, Dr. Farida Zaman. I fear that all the anticipation may be kind of over, overdone. I think I'm going to, my comments are going to be quite um, crude relative to uh, Professor Alavi's, um, and so I'm going to keep them quite brief. Um, and I've got some questions at the end as well. Um, so thanks, Megan, for the book, um, which was a great read. And, you know, if it hadn't been said already, I should really emphasize that it's a beautifully written and produced book. Um, I read it in the course of an evening, which I can't say um, goes for most history books and most history monographs. So thank you so much for that. And it's beautifully written. You have, um, you have delightful prose. Um, okay, so Professor Alavi has already touched on a lot of the big kind of concepts and themes. So I think I'm going to sort of um, cull my, my comments as I, as I go along, as it were. Um, so one thing that I think is really um, an interesting aspect of this book, obviously, is kind of reading as a, as a practice, as a sort of embodied practice. Um, it's now quite a familiar argument that literacy rates are a poor index of the actual impact of reading materials, especially in the age of print. Megan makes this point elegantly in her first chapter and throughout the book, really, that strong and durable oral traditions mean that Medina's actual impact was much greater than print and circulation figures alone can tell us. Nevertheless, the word readership is used throughout, uh, especially in the context of what Megan argues was Medina's quest for a specifically Muslim readership. Um, then Megan also talks, and she also develops a sort of an argument alongside this about kind of somatic engagement with Medina, the sort of uh, and the, the history of kind of materiality and uh, the visual culture and the kind of the visual elements of the newspaper. Um, so I was wondering to what extent the somatic and material engagement um, applies kind of particularly to the kind of the reading, the reading public or the kind of reading Muslims, or whether that might gesture towards a way of kind of conceptualizing the engagement of the non, of the kind of non-reading readers, as it were. Might we speculate about either the limits of the somatic engagement with the newspaper if it's being sort of read aloud um, so, you know, the impact of what's the impact sort of, I guess, of the calligraphy or the production or the materiality of the newspaper on these readers. Um, how do the oral and the somatic, I guess, interact um, for non-literate Muslims? Um, I'm quite sure that they do have an impact, but I wonder if this is something, Megan, that you'd like to sort of maybe expand upon um, here or, or elsewhere. Um, sticking to the question of the somatic and the material, it's also worth noting that Megan's book is obviously a kind of a really great contribution to the history of printing technologies, as has already been said. 
In the spirit of much recent work on colonial science and technology, Megan resists the diffusionist model of technologies that originate uh, in Europe and then are sort of transplanted wholesale into colonial contexts. Megan's work on the lithograph adds implicitly to, for instance, um, David Arnold's call to pay attention to the everyday technologies that were assimilated, appropriated, adapted, and inflected in the Indian context. So he's talking about things like typewriters, which is sort of slightly later, um, those also sort of contemporaneous um, technology. Um, and Megan's account of the indigenization of lithographic printing in Bijanor, um alludes to that kind, of, that kind of work, I think. I mean, she talks very kind of sensitively and in detail about, for instance, the sourcing of local inks um, and the attempt to develop local names for these inks. I think that's the kind of detail that really um, contributes to that sort of, again, it's quite a sort of subtle critique of that sort of diffusionist um, history of technology, colonial technology. Um, so I was already aware, I think, of how time consuming the work of producing a lithographed newspaper must have been, but I was struck in Megan's account by the physicality of the labor of producing a newspaper too in this period. Megan writes in some detail about the process of producing Medina, the importing of lithographic stones, the filing and grinding smooth of multiple heavy stones at a time, the surely eye straining work of meticulously inscribing Nastalik on paper, and using a variety of chemicals and egg whites to transfer the writing to the stones, or even more strenuously, I think, writing us backwards onto the stones directly, and then correcting any errors by hand. Megan produces a rich account of the veritable hive of activity that was necessary to sustain this kind of work, and the kind of enormous number of individuals that must have been sort of coming in and out of the office in order to sustain this. It's, it reminded me a little bit of, you know, historians critical of the sometimes overly romantic accounts of um, cosmopolitan subjects in the age of steam and print, um, who verged us to think about the less romantic stories of the subalterns below the decks shoveling coal into the furnaces, as it were, to keep the steamship going. In dwelling on this labour, I think your implication and Megan's implication is instead quite a different one. She's urging us to think about the Kazava newspaper as a kind of organic machine. It requires all kinds of bodies and minds and skills working cooperatively to sustain it. Um, so I don't get in your in your account a sort of a sense of tension or that some, you know, that the technological progress of some, it comes at the cost of others. Um, nevertheless, the skeptic in me also wonders if there is in fact a kind of stratification of labor that we ought to be alert to in this space. Um, was there ever conflict or discordance in this space, which, as Professor Alavi has already highlighted, was both a household as well as a space of work and labor? So is there kind of a story of labor um, that we might also kind of tell in, in the story of this very kind of time consuming labor, labor consuming activity? Um, there is a wonderful interplay throughout the book, and, and I think people will have got this from um, Megan's presentation as well, um, this interplay throughout between kind of homogeneity on the one hand and distinction and distinctiveness on the other. Again, literature on the age of steam and print, building in part, of course, on Benedict Anderson's work on imagined communities has tended to overstate, I think, the connective homogenizing influence of new technologies and their attendant networks and products, including for Anderson, of course, um, the newspaper, the quintessential site for imagining the modern nation as a spatial and temporal whole. Megan resists this neat teleology, pointing to Bijanor as a place that was simultaneously part of these developments and also somewhat left behind because it's simultaneously kind of quite early on connected to the telegraph network, albeit through a tributary line, um, but received the railway sort of rather late um, in the day. This produces what she argues is a in this Kuzba, a very particular space time, something quite distinct. And one might assume following on from this that every locality in the age of steam and print likewise followed a slightly different technological trajectory and thus occupied a slightly peculiar um, space time in the age of supposed kind of homogeneity and simultaneity. And so as a question that arises from this is how far Megan you want to sort of push that argument. Do you think, you know, so Bichnall has this very particular kind of technological story that it receives some technology sooner than others. Um, and that definitely challenges our kind of technological diffusionist model, but how far would you take this? You know, how far is the kind of timing um, important to these space times? And is there a danger that we become a, a tiny bit sort of technologically determinist if we kind of hinge quite a lot of our analysis on the kind of timing of technologies? Um, 
I wanted to end with a couple of questions and unsurprisingly and rather selfishly, they relate to my own research interests. Um, First, I wondered about Medina in relationship to other newspapers, such as Zafar Ali Khan's or other sort of, you know, so-called Muslim newspapers, such as Zafar Ali Khan's Zamindar, um, and papers that I've worked on quite a bit, Muhammad Ali's uh, Comrade and Hamdad. So Comrade being his English language paper and Hamdad being the Urdu language sister paper, both produced in Delhi in the 1910s. Megan demonstrates in the book that all of these newspapers have much in common, um, not least because they all experience the same sort of colonial censorship regime and that sort of, you know, inadvertently throws, throws them um, in the same, um, into a similar kind of experience in the 1910s and 20s. Um, but one might have also imagined that among these, you know, self-identifying kind of Muslim newspapers, that there may have also been a kind of competitive element um, in my own work, for instance, I've talked about the way in which Comrade and Hamdad were effectively remapping time and place in the 1910s through the language of Panismism, in a way that I assume Muhammad Ali would have thought was quite particular and special to what he was doing, you know, but quite special to his own intellectual agenda. Um, so if a kind of specific Kasba identity was defined in relationship to that of the big city, as it were, did the Kasba newspaper and its timescape define itself in any way against the timescape of papers such as Comrade and Hamdad, which is sort of hogging so much attention, as it were, in, in the kind of national space um, and in the colonial imagination? Um, and even further afield, did Medina communicate with other, again, sort of so-called Muslim papers further afield, such as um, Rashid Rida's Cairo-based al Manar, which would have some claim in this period to being the kind of most famous kind of Muslim newspaper um, in, in the world. Um, I think, you know, obviously you challenge this idea of kind of to what extent are these sort of Muslim newspapers and to what extent is that sort of self-conscious fashioning. Um, but to the extent that, you know, when we're talking about in this era of kind of pan-Islamism and print and circulation, I think al Manar would be sort of up there. Um, the second question um, that I had, um, and one that was sort of less somewhat unanswered for me, and I think it's partly because it's not the project of your book. So this is kind of an unfair question. Um, but I guess I was left wondering how Medina came to be aligned with the Congress in the first place. Um, this is not necessarily a work of kind of political or intellectual history, although it has those elements. So perhaps this question might be kind of tackled elsewhere. But I didn't get a clear sense of what led Majid Hassan, the founder and longtime proprietor, to align with the Congress, even through the challenges of the 1920s and 30s. So you have a really good articulation of the challenges, but um, I, I wasn't entirely sure what sort of creates this affinity and loyalty and fealty to Congress and not simply to Congress, I suppose, but a particular vision or articulation of, of nationhood, which is itself changing over this time. So it's not like there, there is something stable to be, to be um, loyal to necessarily. I mean, this was a period of course, when even erstwhile Congressy Muslims such as the Ali brothers switched allegiances to the league, um, particularly after the, the publication of the Nehru report. Um, the question is not meant to suggest that Muslim support of Congress is a peculiarity or an aberration that needs specific explanation, but rather to suggest that the particularity of um, Majid Hassan's own political and religious thought um, and those of his family and colleagues in Bijanur might prove an interesting um, and productively challenging addition to the corpus of work on Indian nationalist thought in this period. Um, so he's clearly not, you know, in the pantheon of, of um, Congressy Muslims that people like Mashur Hassan have written about, but it sounds from your account like um, there might be something to say about the development of his sort of ideas and, and, and political thought in that context. Okay, I'm going to leave it there, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I just dive in, Arifa? I, so, Frida, th these were such productive comments. Thank you. Um, I'm so grateful to you for reading the book and um, thinking about and listening to your comments gives me a new set of perspectives on my work that uh, make me feel really energized for building on this book and, um, <clears throat> and developing some of these streams of thought into more you know, articulate contributions. I um, want, there's so much there. I'm sure I'm not going to get to everything because I've been taking a few notes, but I'll start at the, <laughs> I'll start at the beginning of your talk and try to touch on at least a few of your questions. Um, 
and I trust that we'll be able to continue the conversation at another time if we don't get to everything today. Um, thank you very much about, uh, thank you very much for talking and emphasizing the, what, I, what I do feel is an important aspect of the book, thinking about reading as a lived everyday embodied practice. And um, you're right that in thinking about readership, I was playing with the boundary between, you know, literacy in the sense of being able to read written words and literacy in the sense of an oral literacy or um, uh, readership in this in, in that more diffuse sense of readership. Um, but you're also quite right that I'm sometimes playing with that term and it's not always clear, right? If I'm talking about one form of, you know, very literate readership or, um, or another. You asked to what extent, uh, extent the thematic and material engagement um, with the paper is limited to um, readers who were able to read words on the page. I think here uh, I run up against the problem of source material, right? I think that um, one reason why I framed readership in the way that I did is very typical, right? To say, um, I'm going to talk in my book about what I can know about how those, how readers were responding to the newspaper by accessing certainly oral accounts of how readers remember um, talking about the paper, but significantly you know, diary entries, um, records of people seeing, you know, Madani collecting the newspapers in his Almaria um, so that he can uh, refer to them later. Um, and so as a historian, I'm certainly dependent upon literate readers and observers for some of my source material. Ultimately, um, I think that there's enough evidence. Part of what I'm suggesting is that the form and design of the paper could communicate to even readers who weren't able to read the words themselves. For instance, the presence of those diacritics on the title of Medina or something that would have or could have evoked a familiar feeling among those who might not even been able to read the words themselves. This is an undertone and implication of some of my work. But ultimately, it remains that an implication because I am unable to state with certainty what the somatic engagement of um, you know, those who weren't literate um, was with the paper um, themselves because I'm funneling myself through the accounts um, of the literate. So this is a persistent problem for me and one that um, I haven't, a problem that I have not, I've certainly not been able to solve, but instead I've been attempting to kind of gesture towards possibilities um, that, that remain underexplored um, because of uh, difficult, difficulty of access to source material. But I'd love to talk to you about ways, if you have strategies of thinking, you know, even more precisely about what these forms of somatic engagement might be. Um, and this, in my, so in, in my listening to your comments, this comment about somatic engagement was certainly linked to your question about you know, the stratification of labor in the household and how we might be able to access um, or comment on the experiences of labor um, in, the, um, in the compound itself. Um, so there's a few things that I've done in the process of researching that I did to attempt to get a sense of what this might be like. You know, I, I, I walked the household itself and um, certainly was interested in and paid close attention to the design and the flow of where, work, where certain work might have happened. Um, there weren't, as far as I could tell, there weren't prominent or kind of polished living accommodations for laborers. My impression is that the labor, the manual labor was probably taken from localities. And, and I, I didn't write this in the book because um, I didn't have, you know, firm kind of documentation of this fact, but currently in Bijnor and Nagina, a neighboring Qasba, in, um, it, it, there is still a tendency for um, kind of businesses and um, and publications where the editorial kind of 
or managerial layer is highly mobile and is moving you know, between qasbahs, even maybe between the qasbah and cities, whereas um, the pool of um, kind of craftsmen or laborers are more firmly locally based. So I would, um, so I would extrapolate that this was the case, especially because um, Ahiuddin's manual on lithography, you know, when he's complaining about the lack of generalized knowledge about lithography that's shared between localities, he expresses frustration about the fact that craftsmen remain so married to their specific locality. And this is con in contrast to the editorial layer, which might shift and move between locations. So these are some of the ways that I have um, extrapolated to see, to, to, to develop an understanding of, you know, craftsmen as, and laborers as even more locally grounded than, than the editorial layer. Um, now, whether there was stratification intention, this would be, this is a very, it's a fascinating question and one that requires, requires a kind of oral history component that is missing from this book, right? Tracking down and talking to every layer of, you know, from, from craftsmen to those who are grinding the stones after etching. Um, and this is simply work that I was not able to um, do for this particular project, but um, it's work that's very important. And I hope that in future projects, you know, future researchers might be able to drill even deeper down into what these, you know, tensions and mechanics of, um, you know, the dynamics of a printing workshop might actually be. Interestingly, Medina Press is considering reopening its printing press for the publication of Qurans recently. So when I last visited Bijanur, they shared this um, ambition to actually begin the press anew um, through, public, through publishing copies of the Quran. And in that case, I would be fascinated to see and to visit and to talk and see how the, 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 um, how the, the press is actually functioning. I do know, so Munir Akhtar, so who's the son of Mojib Hassan, he is very well-versed in printing techniques. He is the one who walked me through and showed me the stones and was kind of talking me through the different strategies that were being used. So he is very proficient technically in, in printing um, despite the press having been closed long ago. Um, and so I know, I know I'm kind of just talking around the issue a lot. I just want to emphasize this is such an important question and one that um, unfortunately I wasn't able to answer in this book, but that I hope that in future work I might be able to pay more attention to. Okay, so now to get to one or two of your specific questions, because this is also generative. I could talk for, for hours. Um, so how Medina thought about itself in comparison to other papers? Competition, you're, you're exactly right. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk about solidarity <laughs> and there's a lot of talk about you know, representing the, um, you know, all newspapers sticking up for one another, but of course there was also a competitive element um, as well. And so the way that this, um, you know, the way that this manifests um, might be in, you know, uh, like targeting editorials that appear in other newspapers and critiquing them, right? Um, but the first, I mean, certainly English language newspapers got a lot of flack in Medina. So Pioneer, for instance, ironically, where Pioneer published, a, you know, an image of one of the editors. Um, in the late 19, in uh, the mid 1940s, um, but uh, pioneers actually used as a reference for like what's wrong with the world. And one of the early poems that appears in Medina called um, like the, the quickly changing times. And I think that it appears in the book um, as well. Now, the criticisms of other Urdu papers are more indirect um, and so would, would appear in kind of the calling out of specific people, the um, you know the critique of a book in a book review that's aligned with a particular paper. And I'm sorry, no specific good anecdotes are coming to mind. Um, but if it does, if if something does come to mind later on in this conversation, I'll definitely um, re, I'll definitely um, tell that story. Now for 
how it re connects to, you know, Comrade and Hamdard specifically. Um, I mean, Medina was very much in favor and a, a very prominent supporter of the Ali brothers and was constantly covering, you know, the, um, you know, the imprisonment and um, of, um, you know, Muhammad Ali and also the, um, was reprinting the, the prominent statements made by his mother in supporting, you know, her imprisoned sons. And we, so, so I don't see any direct examples of kind of specific competition there. I think that Comrade and Hamdard would have been uh, targeted to a different kind of audience because they were um, more, I think they were more comfortably targeting a kind of wealthier, um, slightly more um, rarefied audience than Medina. I think from early on, Medina was kind of distinguishing itself from some of these high profile, slightly more expensive papers um, published in Delhi and Kolkata um, and even Lahore. And so I think that um, my sense is that it was thinking about itself as satisfying a niche that was coherent with, you know, Comrade and Hamdard, but not in direct competition with. And um, I believe, so now, now I'm having trouble remembering, I believe that Hamdard was produced using metal types that print. Is that right? Or was it used, was it using lithography? I, so sorry, I, I, my impression of what I know, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, is that Hamdard was using more expensive technology too, is that it was like, even in the looking at Hamdard, you could kind of just see cash flying everywhere, right? Al-Hilal was the same way. You look at, Al, you find little, you, I've seen some issues of Al-Hilal in person, and it is printed on archival quality paper, right? Even today, you, you, you touch those pages, they're heavy, they crackle. They are literally burnished and they're, they're printed using metal typeset technology that would have screamed, you know, we are an extremely expensive publication. And Medina, even though it was, um, Medina was certainly produced with care and uh, particularly with care to, um, to the, the, the quality of the calligraphy. But if you look at, I have actually had an opportunity to look at physical copies of Medina, but only very late in the day. I, you know, as often happens, right? The more you know people, the more you learn. And so it was only like a couple of years ago that I was able to see actual physical copies instead of the microfilm copies. And the paper is not of high quality, right? Which is one reason why many of them haven't last. They, they lasted, they were, they were like most newspapers printed on kind of very acidic paper that's very vulnerable um, to the elements. But even by looking at them physically, and my impression is that Hamdard was, was similar to Al-Halal in that sense of being um, very, having high standards in the, um, in that kind of the, the, the paper that it was using and um, accessing technology that would have signified a kind of status. So this, this is the way that I've thought about Medina as signaling to readers, even without reading anything, the, the, the targets of, of their readership as the paper of the common people. Okay, so I know I've been talking for way too long, but let's see. So I haven't seen specific references to Almanar in Cairo, but um, I will say that there's definitely a lot of chatter about Cairo, Mecca, Medina, Europe. I mean, th they are constantly printing reports from international correspondents, unnamed, but the implication is that, you know, uh, well placed well-placed correspondents are writing letters back to Medina or sending telegrams back to Medina and keeping them abreast of what's going on. And they're, pub and they're publishing these as um, reports from international correspondents. So news from Cairo does make it into Medina, but I do not recall, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I do not recall any um, specific mentions of, of Al-Minar, but I'll let you know if I, if, I, if I have to correct myself later on when I'm reading. Um, okay, finally, how Medina became aligned with Congress. Such an interesting invitation that you've stated to, to scholars really to think a little bit about how, how Medina might fit into histories of the Congress overall. I will say that, you know, it's not apparent from, you know, the 1910s and even early 1920s 
that Medina is going to be, right, a Congress paper. It's only really in 1937 during that by-election when it becomes kind of consolidated and there's this extreme frustration with, um, again, it's very locally based, I think, this, this, this dramatic, it's locally based and it's iterative. And I think that 1937 was a real turning point when, um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this much during the book talk, but in, you know, when a prominent figure um, who, you know, switches party alliances, you know, from Muslim League to Congress and the Muslim League um, insists on a by-election and Medina and Majid Hassan are extremely frustrated by this because they, they argue um, very compellingly to you know local audiences that what should matter is local tradition, like local traditions of service, local commitments of service, and they critique the league because the league has chosen someone who might look good on paper, kind of looks respectable, but has doesn't have a record of service in the local community. Um, so I think if we were looking at Medina specifically from that frame point, what what we would see is kind of several data points from the late 1910s until early 1940s, where we see a subtle shift, you know, away from the league and towards Congress um, until like in 1937, it's really this flashpoint where it becomes um, anti-league. But yes, I, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question, um, thinking about looking anew at the newspaper specifically through that lens. Thank you so much for your comments. They've been so generative. Um, I'll stop there so that we have at least some time for conversation, but thank you again for you. Ma'am, do you, uh, uh, Dr. Farida Zaman, do you want to respond to that if you want to? No, no, I think that's fine. I think, um, I think as, as Megan says, a lot of these questions are very kind of open ended, even the specific ones are sort of unanswerable in lots of ways. So but thank you to Megan for taking the time to actually respond to all of them. Yeah. I thought I was only going to respond to a few, but I got carried away. <laughs> very grateful. Very helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, we have around four questions from the participants, and I hope while we are asking you the questions, some might mo some more might pour in. Uh, so the first question is: How did the newspaper Madina promote the idea of independence for the subcontinent and the partition? Great. Okay. So I'll just do them one at a time, shall I? Okay, so how yes, did um, Medina pr promote um, independence? I think, so initially, in this changed over time as it did with the many publications, right? So in the 1910s, um, we, as we, oh, and this actually links with one of Frida's questions that I didn't get to. I think that from, for Medina, Comrade and Hamdard, because they were completely shut down, I think, served as a kind of cautionary tale for Medina. Medina itself almost got shut down several times but it was constantly trying to skirt that boundary between um, communicating to its readers dissatisfaction with the colonial government while satisfying the rigid requirements of, you know, of colonial legislation regarding um, papers. And I think that this complicates in some ways our, the earliest views of Medina's kind of views towards the colonial government because it was extremely hampered in expressing those views like most newspapers. But we do see a kind of um, a loyalist tone in the 1910s in the sense of reaffirming, you know, support for um, the, the colonial government's approach to World War I. We see a sense of um, a real commitment to trying to convince the government to support, um, you know, the Ottoman cause and the, the um, Khilafat movement. And I think from its very origins, it was very polyphonic in who it was speaking to. It was clearly speaking to colonial surveyors and, co you know, British readers, um, but also through, um, often through Persian poetry, it was sending different sorts of messages to, to readers that, satis that that communicated real discontent with the situation. For instance, this poem, um, The Quickly Changing Times, um, I think there was, this, there was this hope among many newspaper authors, sometimes justified, 
that poems might be read less carefully by kind of, you know, surveyors for political content. And so you sometimes have buried in, um, you know, these poems, for instance, using the English language newspaper, The Pioneer, as a symbol for all that's wrong with the world, right? This is a, a coded invocation of, uh, a coded, um, not, not invocation, but a, a coded criticism of um, English educated, English educated Indians who are not, you know, cultivating their, their knowledge of um, kind of the small town context, yes, but it's also a, definitely a veiled criticism of the British as well. So the first decade we see kind of veiled criticism, but at the same time, extremely um, vibrant interest in league activities, in Congress activities, a strong commitment to, um, to uh, communicating the content of those organizations to its, its members. And this becomes only more extreme over time. Eventually in the early 1920s, Medina runs afoul of the colonial government several times, um, having to forfeit its surety, this large amount of money that it had to deposit with the British government as a kind of um, a guarantee that they wouldn't do anything bad. But, you know, something bad included anything that um, questioned the motives of the British government, right? So anytime something that appeared that implied that the British didn't have Indians' best interests at heart could be justification for claiming that surety and, um, and shutting the paper down, um, which did happen um, a few times. So following the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, a particularly um, kind of colorful poem, in fact, inspired the entire newspaper to be shut down. Medina changed its name to Yasrab, you know, another, like a, a, you know, a reference to Medina and continued to circulate under a kind of nom de plume um, so that it could get into Punjab um, around the colonial surveillance. Ultimately, it was unsuccessful. Um, and so they ended up having to switch back um, to, to the name Medina. But we can see in these ways that um, it was a constant, everyday, very granular effort to try to walk this fine line between strict surveillance, the threat of being shut down, right? Thinking about Kamrad um, and Hamdard and the, um, and even threats of imprisonment, right? The editors were imprisoned um, and, and sometimes even though um, editors, you know, were imprisoned on occasion, there were, there were attempts to try to avoid that as well. So that the Medina might fire an editor and then once the, surveillance, the colonial surveillance was no longer paying attention, rehire the editor back. So there are these small kind of, there are these everyday strategies used to try to figure out where the boundaries lay about what could be expressed. Um, I think it's fair to say the Medina was constantly and persistently pushing that envelope, right? And so looking at Medina closely can, can give us a sense of how, you know, support for, you know, Congress's policies um, in its acceptability in kind of colonial context was changing over the years. Um, and in, I mean, by the early 1940s, um, I mean, Medina took a stance that was against the founding of, of Pakistan as a homeland for Muslims. Um, and again, this is, this is not to say that all Urdu newspapers, uh, uh, you know, were, were, um, you know, anti-Pakistan, anti not at all. This is just one significant strand of a, a, the Urdu public that was, um, you know, pro-Congress and anti the founding of um, Pakistan through the League. But Medina's pathway to supporting independence and nationalism was through a very full-throated support for Congress by the late 1930s and early 1940s. Um, basically arguing very, very in a full-throated way that Muslims had a, um, a right and a, a strong and important place in Congress leadership and reaffirmed through that by the late 1930s, 1940s, they're really not talking to the British anymore at all, right? They're talking to their well-established readership about what the boundaries of a new nation should be. And they're seeing their responsibility as informing a, um, a well-educated public so that they could make informed decisions. I hope that that, I know that's a long answer, but this is maybe in a kind of just thinking about Professor Alvi's comments, um, you know, about microhistory. I think 
it's in the micro histories, right? That we see Medina's role. They were constantly, you know, balancing that line and communicating with readers as they were balancing that line as colonial subjects. Uh, Ma'am, the next question, I think you have already answered somewhere in your talk. So let us move to a more pressing question, I think, which research which will be very useful for research scholars in India. They want to know how uh, were you able to find Madina newspaper archives in India and what archives and universities or libraries would, would you recommend to a scholar who wants to work uh, in, the, in a similar uh, period? Great. Okay. Great, great question. So um, initially, my first exposure to Medina was through a microfilm resource. So the University of London, Royal Holloway, happens to have a microfilm, a full run of Medina um, that no one really had looked at. And it had been formed. So these, a lot of newspapers were put on microfilm, I believe in the 70s and 80s, as part of this kind of push to record um, a broad range of publications. And ironically, the only two microfilm um, collections, microfilm copies that I know of are one at University of London Royal Holloway and two at the US Library of Congress. But even at the US Library of Congress, as far as I know, I am the only person, I was the first person to look at that microfilm source. I had to actually get it out of storage. They had to find it and then kind of label it and make it able to be shared with me. So it was definitely not a sufficiently, it was an underutilized source at the US Library of Congress and, and wasn't a priority. So those were my two, that was my first exposure to the newspaper. However, then what I started to do is go to libraries around North India. So the next, the first time I saw kind of physical published copies um, was in Kandala, a qasba where um, a man named Morlana Nur al-Hassan Rashid has a private library, a very substantial private library. And I had heard that he had an interest in newspapers and um, you know, had very fond memories of Medina. And he actually has some um, commemorative copies of Medina. So every 10 years, Medina would kind of publish a best of set of you know, newspaper issues, or even just a digest of past issues for committed readers to celebrate you know, certain milestones in the newspaper's history. And so um, Molana Nur al-Hassan Rashid has some of those copies. But again, those aren't the day-to-day -day copies, right? So that was my first exposure to the physical copies. So to answer the question of how you do research, private libraries are um, a very, are a well, have a wealth of resources. Exposure to them, of course, is very difficult because you have to you know, meet people and ask around and get to know people. Um, but I'm sure that um, all of you are more than up for that task, um, but, but local libraries are often a good resource. Uh, finally, eventually, um, once I got to know the, the family that had published Medina had actually entrusted to a friend an, uh, a, an actual copy of every newspaper almost from its beginning until you know the 1960s. And it was very late in the day that I was able to see actual printed copies um, as they might've been distributed um, and that was really a kind of just an, an accident in the sense of um, we knew each other long enough that they felt comfortable kind of sharing those copies with me. That being said, there are collections of newspapers. It, there, there are collections that are known for having really good collections of newspapers in India. Raza Rampur Library has a great collection of newspapers. The, the images that I shared of the subscription labels um, are, uh, that, that are actually still stuck to the paper are from Reza Rampur Library. So I found um, Reza Rampur extremely useful as a way of getting a sense of what newspapers were circulating in that area at that time. Many of them are um, kind of all, all connected to the same subscribers. So I, I got, I, you get a real nice sense of um, subscriber continuity. And they also have many copies of Medina um, at Reza Rampur Library as well. Not a full run, but they do have um, full copies as well. So it was, Reza Rampur is also a place where I was able to see um, copies of Medina in person. Um, there are also some useful books um, that have been published, uh, digests of uh, where to find certain newspapers in, um, or the newspapers in India. And I'm just 
I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on the name of one of these volumes that I found the most helpful now. Whoever asked that question, please feel free to email me. I'll find that source in my, you know, in, in my records and I can send you that book because it has Reza Rampur in there, but it's also done a really good job of writing kind of in digest form, like in this, you know, in this archive, you'll be able to find issues of XYZ um, newspaper. And that's something that I used to trace newspapers around different archives in India. So I hope that I hope that helps. It's a little bit of, and I'm happy to give advice. You know, if, if you're looking for something and if I can help, I'm very happy to, um, to, to help in any way I can. That is really helpful, ma'am. I think uh, scholars who are interested can uh, contact ma'am on her email ID that she has mentioned in her presentation. Uh, I think it has been a very long event and even though I would like it to continue, I think uh, it is quite late in the night and people would have to rush to their dinners. <laughs> Thank you so much having for all. having this event at such a late time for you. I really appreciate it. Uh, no, ma'am, it is our pleasure to have all of you. I would now like to ask Zeba to give the vote of thanks because she's quite excited about all of all of you on her our forum and she's the one actually who's working on this theme and working on I think Adab Zeba you should actually tell uh, ma'am what you're working on in a one line you know so that she might help you <laughs> so over to you Zeba. Uh, thank you so much Ariba for putting me in the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I was just thinking about this that I'm going to shoot 